Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today I'm so happy to share this project with you because I really love how it came out. If you would like a real-time version of this, it's over two hours long. You can find it now in Critique Club. I will have a link in the video description. It's $5 a month and you get access to over a hundred real-time watercolor and mixed media tutorials and um, monthly creative prompts. Plus you can upload your artwork for feedback from me. I started off by sketching the door here on my watercolor paper. And this is the Meaden seven inch by 10 inch watercolor block that's 100% cotton. I love to recommend this paper because it is really beautiful quality and very affordable. When you're looking at 100% cotton watercolor papers in like say Michaels or any of your brick and mortar stores, they're expensive. Even if you're looking at them at your um, online stores, they're very expensive. So I like to be able to offer something or recommend something that is 100% cotton that will uh, get the job done and be a pleasure to paint on and not hinder your experience as an artist. I'm using a black wing matte pencil to sketch basically because it's really dark and soft. So because it's soft, it erases very easily. I don't have to press hard to make a line, but because it's really dark, you can see my lines really well. I would not recommend you draw this dark on your own paper, but um, I got to make sure it shows up well on the screen. When I do things like the, uh, the hinges, what I'm trying to do is just make them symmetrical and make them match each other and not necessarily worry about them being exactly like they are in the picture. I just want to have this door that's relatively symmetrical and uh, that way when I start to paint the more organic um, elements like the stones and the like kind of the branches and like it looks almost like there's like some uh, vines of evergreen some sort of um, viney evergreen plant growing around the building. I just want to get um, get kind of the focal point fairly symmetrical. Um, the steps here coming down in front of the door, I think are also really nice for adding depth since they get larger and wider as they come towards the viewer. They physically do get wider, but also having something like that almost leans to like a one point perspective and does make the, um, the piece feel a little bit deeper and a little bit more dimensional. I'm just basically doing some parallel lines around the door to get the kind of stony or stonework architecture. The door is quite set in um, and I want to kind of get that uh, effect. And I am using that T-square for, <laughs> for all it's worth. It would be nice to draw it freehand and have it like really whimsical, but man, I struggle with architecture. It's something I'm really trying to get better at and it's something I'm really going to focus on a lot next year getting better at. I've been working on it a lot these last few months and um, the T-square really helps, especially when you're using a watercolor block because a, base, a watercolor block, in case you don't know, it's uh, like a pad of watercolor paper that is sealed on all four sides. And there's like a little gap where you can put a palette knife in and slice off that top painting after you're done painting it. But the nice thing is you have those straight edges that you can use a T-square against. And these T-squares are a steal of a deal. I think, let's see, I paid about $7 for three of them on Amazon. It's from the Mr. Pen Company and um, they're great. I have one at, um, at my desk upstairs and one at my desk downstairs and they are wonderful. Now the watercolors I'm using here are actually sample dots from Masha's Watercolor, which is this beautiful handmade watercolor color maker on Etsy. And I know I don't like talk about handmade watercolors that much because honestly, um, I, I really enjoy the consistency of commercially made watercolor, but I will tell you that they're, these Masha watercolors are so gorgeous. And I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to link to her shop. I'm not affiliated with her, but I'm going to warn you that, uh, there's some really gorgeous stuff. And if your want monster has not been behaving lately, I'm going to strongly suggest you do not visit her shop because Man, there's some gorgeous things there. My want monster has been filing down the bars in its cage and wants to break free. So um, I'm just, but she does sell the dot samples, those generous dot samples, I think for like $2 each. So if you do want to try a couple of the colors, you can do it without going completely bonkers. But man, it's not beautiful. Um, and I hadn't used those dot samples. I don't know why they've just been sitting in my, uh, my palette with my super granulating colors. And I was like, you know, I would like to just use these up so I don't have them in there. They're starting to stick to each other. And um, I'm like, I'm just going to use these up. There's probably just enough to do this painting. I still had so much left over on those dot samples that um, I could do a few more of these paintings if I wanted to. And I might want to because this was really, really fun to do. I kind of wish I had, um, I had uh, scanned my drawing so I could just transfer it. But I don't think my drawing was perfect. I would say if you wanted something to trace, my reference photos from, from Unsplash, you could just trace the reference photo uh, if you want to be a little more accurate. I think that would probably be the way to go rather than um, 
and then me making a pattern for that. Uh, this color here actually is a home, uh, not really homemade, but I had a tube of Potter's Pink that I wasn't crazy about because it seemed really weak. Uh, so what I did was I just took the tube, I squeezed it all out between like a couple, like three full pans. And then I added some like, I think a quinacridone rose to it and maybe some benzimidine brown. I'm not sure. I added a couple colors to it to kind of like juice up the color a bit. And then I really loved it because I had the, the texture from the potter's pink, but then I had the color from those other colors. So that's something you can do if you either have like maybe two tubes of the same color and you're like, I don't need two tubes of this, or you're not really that crazy about the color. You can always um, customize it so it does meet your needs. That way you're not wasting the paint because I love the granulation of the potter's pink, but it just didn't have the color payout that I wanted. Um, so the important thing is that you use your supplies and you make them work for you. If you don't like it the way it is, you know, you've bought and paid for that supply already. You can change it. It's up to you. Don't worry about being precious. If you are worried about maybe wasting it, something I'd recommend also with Potter's Pink or any of these like heavily granulating colors, if you're feeling like I'm just not getting the color out of the tube, um, it could be that the the, the uh, pigment has settled out of the binder. So what you can do is take like a, a long needle tool, like the kind that potters use, and uh, stick that in there into the tube and give it a good stir. Or maybe even a, like a skinny barbecue skewer, just try not to break it off in the tube, but give it a good stir because because your pigment might be all settled down to the bottom. So that's one thing you might want to do. But, um, you know, you got a tube of color you're not crazy about, squirt some out, mix it with some other pigments, see what you can make. Maybe you'll make something that's more versatile for you. Um, I really liked the dark stones at the edge of the steps. So I'm adding a little bit more of that watercolor, that same uh, stuff I used in the background, just the darker colors. And I'm using this flat brush. And I love this technique for giving the uh, essence of stonework because I didn't want to cover up the beautiful granulated texture that I had in the background. So I'm using this flat brush and just kind of stamping with the edge of the flat brush, just tap, 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 tap the edges of the, of the stones. And that gives me the, um, the, like the feeling of the stones, the, the hint at those stones without me overworking it because I didn't want to overwork it. When you have such beautiful granulating colors and you want to let that show through and you don't want to, if you keep, glazing over those colors or painting over those colors, you're going to totally ruin the effect of the granulation. Speaking of granulation, anytime you really want to get that granulated effect with your colors, you want to let it air dry and you want the paint to be in a really, really wet wash because how the granulating colors work best is when you have the, um, the pigment can kind of float in a really wet wash of watercolor and then the pigments will start to separate and settle out and that's where you get that effect. And if you're like, oh, Lindsay, I don't have any of those super granulating colors. I'm so bummed out. I'd love to paint this. What you want to do then if you don't have any like quote unquote granulating colors, use your ultramarine blue. We all I'll have that if you've been painting with watercolor for any amount of time use any of your browns like burnt sienna or burnt umber van dyke brown any of those browns mix them together and do the same thing if you want to tint things like a little bit of a green you could add some um you can add some viridian you could add some chrome oxide you can add whatever whatever other little tints of colors raw sienna that you want in there pinks it's up to you adding any of those colors in there um as needed but just make sure the wash is really wet and then let it dry naturally and then you will get that granulation from the ultramarine blue you just need one granulating color in there to get that effect and the colors will split apart a bit and you'll have that really pretty texture. You can try it on different papers you have too, like little samples and see what paper gives you the best effect. Generally, I get the best effect from a rougher paper that has a lot of sizing. Um, this meat and paper, this is cold press, but they also offer it in rough. If you prefer the rough texture, you could purchase that. Same price, I think. Um, or uh, Arches works really well. That's pricier, but that's a very heavily sized paper. So it gives you that effect. Um, just test what you have and see what works best for you. This is one of those rare paintings where I loved every stage of it. I'm looking at it back now and I'm like, oh yeah, I love how it looks at this stage. And it's like, oh, I love how it looks at that stage. I feel like this this is one of those rare paintings that didn't really have the hot mess phase. Although you could argue at the end when I was putting snow on it, then I might've had the hot mess phase. But um, I just really, uh, I really enjoyed painting this. It was a lot of fun. It was a pretty simple design, but um, maybe I was just kind of feeling in the holiday spirit. I don't know, but I was just really enjoying this. Now, the one thing you do have to worry about, everything has uh, has a positive and a ne negative. Sometimes when things are going so well like this, it can be hard to want to do more to it. It can be hard to want to finish a painting because you get precious about it. Then you're like, oh, well, what if I mess it up? Um, the, the 
key, I think, is just to keep going and just to trust yourself and just know that if you make a mistake, that you can fix it. And I think part of the part of the reason that kept me going on this, even though I was kind of like, oh, I really like it at this stage. Oh, I really like it at that stage, is that from the get-go, I was planning on using gouache. I was planning on using gouache on the door and on the wreath because I really wanted those... Um, I wanted that to really pop, and I also didn't want to do too much to the stones because I wanted to preserve the granulating texture. So because I knew I was going to be adding gouache, I knew there's nothing I could do uh, in these uh, earlier layers to mess it up. And I think sometimes having that... Um, Having that in in your back pocket, knowing that you can always do these other mixed media techniques to your work can help you be brave as you go through the process. I think generally, a lot of times in our paintings, we regret that, just like in life, we regret the things that we don't do, not the things we do. You know, a lot of times I'll see people's paintings and usually the number one issue, and this is something where Critique Club comes in really handy, is like when I'm critiquing um, uh, people's artwork, generally the number one problem I see with, with uh, artwork is that people are not going darker enough with their values. They're getting a little shy and timid when it comes down to putting those really darks in, those really dark darks. Uh, that's one of the reasons I will often put my darks in first because I know if I get that, um, if I get that kind of scary thing out of the way right off the bat, then everything else is a piece of cake and I can feel brave throughout the rest of the painting. And if I do make a big mistake, I made a mistake at the beginning. So I could just start again and it's not that big of a deal. So uh, that's something to kind of, kind of think about. It's kind of like the old uh, adage of eating a frog. You know, if you eat, eat a frog the first thing you do in the day, then the rest of the day is going to seem easy because you've done the, the worst task out of the first first thing and then everything else is a breeze. That's kind of how I look at adding those dark values. I don't mind adding the dark values, but um, it is kind of the scarier part of the picture. Now, I want to give the impression of these uh, wooden, like that kind of wainscoting type pattern of the, the wood on the door. So I'm just using my T-square and just dragging my brush across it. Um, just be careful as you get beyond the area that's going to be red because you're you're probably going to get some paint underneath that T-square and it's going to want to drag. So just be careful. I just wanted to get that subtle texturing. And if you do accidentally go into like the stonework underneath, you could scrub it back. This is gouache lifts up a lot easier than watercolor because it doesn't absorb into the paper. It sits on top of the paper. So you do have that little bit of um, uh, kind of an undo button there. I w and I was being sloppy. You don't need to be, you know, you can be careful and avoid that. And uh, the colors I'm using here, I've in the little tiny portable painter palette, I have the Daniel Smith mixing set, which is a uh, Hansi yellow, pyrrole red, ultramarine blue, and titanium white. And then I did buy a burnt umber when I bought that set. Um, I have a goal to buy like the smaller mixing sets of all the major brands and uh, review them and compare them and see what's the best value for money. I think that Daniel Smith gouache is, is top quality. It is kind of expensive though. Um, and then those little dabs on my palette, the, uh, the yellow deep and the Thalo Blue RM Gram, and I haven't used, I just bought them. I haven't used them enough to really form an opinion, but so far so good. They actually felt a lot like their watercolors, um, but you know, like I said, it's not enough to give a good review. I like using the Thalo Blue with that Pyrrole Red to make a nice deep dark shadow, and then I've got a dab of Holbein Black on my palette just because I was just reaching into my pro gouache drawer. I think this would be a really nice design for a Christmas card or maybe even like a you know, just a frame as a Christmas decoration. And I plan on scanning this um, and then maybe framing it and putting it up for Christmas. But one thing I will say, I noticed mixing the watercolors and gouache in this fashion is that at the end, it photograph, it'll photograph well, but at the end, I almost feel like it, it seems like some of the colors are not as deep as I want them. So I will probably spray this or wax it, do something to kind of bring the luster back in the colors. Um, if I wax it, I will do a video on that and share it on YouTube just to, so I can show you the process. I bought a thing of wax and um, for watercolors, and I don't think I've really used it all that much, but this might be a nice option. I might try waxing it and varnishing it and mounting it on a board. That might be kind of fun to, to try once I've scanned it because I think a, a picture like this I would be more inclined just to use for a, my Christmas card um, because I've kind of gone away from making handmade cards for Christmas to uh, doing a painting and having it printed for for cards for my friends and family. But uh, I think uh, I think this would, this would just lend itself really well. I think the aspect ratio of seven inches by 10 inches would work really well for that. And, um, and yeah, I, I just think it would be a really nice, um, a really nice thing to do. Um, so I'm just pretty much 
adding the details here. I took the red and phthalo blue since I'd already used that for the shadows under the wreath and I'd used it in the, the other colors like the green for the wreath. I took those two colors and I added some black to it because I did want a nice deep black but black can feel like a black hole and be rather dull and you know honestly after I, I've seen this painting dry I kind of regret using the black at all. I think if I just used the pyrrole red and the um, the phthalo blue that would have been dark enough and the, the my blacks my shadows would have much more luster than they did with the black but I'm hoping that by waxing this painting eventually it'll bring that luster back so if you're curious about that if you'd like to see a tutorial on waxing a watercolor painting just go ahead and leave me a comment um if people want to see it then I can certainly do I'll certainly try it because I'm on the fence whether I'm going to try that or not but if enough of you guys want to see it I will do it I will sacrifice this painting to see if it works I'll scan it first though just to be on the safe side but um my gosh, I just enjoyed painting this from beginning to end. And it's funny because I was kind of in a mood. I've, um, I have I call it uh, procrasti cleaning. And sometimes I'm just like, oh, I know I need to get this video up, but I don't know exactly what I want to do. But it's going to be good because I'm kind of late getting my Critique Club video up for November. Um, so like while I'm thinking about it, I will clean. And I cleaned my filming room. I cleaned the room of Horde. I cleaned and I vacuumed and mopped my house. I took down the fall decorations. It's, you know, I was, I was procrasti cleaning. Um, I also do this thing called uh, productive procrastination where sometimes I'll have a lot of creative ideas, but I'll have like actually one thing I have to actually get done. And I will do all these other creative ideas I have. And, and then that, that thing I actually have to do, that will be like, I will, I will start it when I just have enough time to finish it before it's due. Are you guys like that? Do you do you do you, um, do you procrasti clean or do pro productive procrastination? Let me know that too in the comments below. I want to know if I'm alone on this or not. But at least I'm getting stuff done, so uh, so I don't think it's bad. I think sometimes having a deadline is good because. Um, or having something you absolutely have to get done is good because then it's like those good ideas pop into your head like, oh, I wish I had time to do this because this is a good idea. So I just have to make sure that when those ideas pop in my head and I don't have time to do them, that I put them on a little note in my phone. So when I do find that I have this big chunk of time and I'm not feeling inspired and I don't know what to do, then I can look at that list and be like, oh yeah, I forgot I wanted to try that. And then I can go ahead and, and do those. Um, now I'm adding a little, I'm making a, a highlight for the wreath. Now the wreath in the reference photo is very dark. It's almost black looking, but I wanted the wreath to be the focal point. Like I said, I thought this would be a nice Christmas um, card idea. And so I am mixing a little bit of white with that premixed, the green that I had mixed earlier. And I'm doing just little highlights in there. And I'm kind of playing with how, what I want to do for highlights and brightening that bow because the bow really isn't as bright as I wanted it to be. Probably because the door ended up, I made the door a little bit brighter than um, than I was first planning to. So just kind of keep that in mind. Keep your contrasts in mind. Make sure you have enough uh, contrast here and there to get the look that you want to make sure your focal points really do pop the way you want them to. I'm using really dark gray here and doing that stamping technique that I showed you in the stones originally. I'm doing that on these little, this little weird uh, kind of bump out in the bottom of the building. It's almost like a foundation type area. And I'm just kind of reinforcing my steps. And boy, I, I love the way this looks. I put a little dark under the door so you could kind of see that it isn't like, you know, there's a little gap between the stones and the door. And uh, yeah, I'm just kind of... Um, I'm just kind of puttering away. I decided that the wreath needed a little more shadow to help it pop out against the door and a little more shadow kind of um, next to the door on the stones to make the door recess in a little bit more. So it's a little like, you know, puttery. We're, we're just kind of fussing around here at this point. And um, it's hard to tell where the gouache is wet, how dark it is there in that upper left corner. So I'm giving it a quick dry so I can really assess my values. Now, if you just want to slightly adjust something, a colored pencil is great for that. I'm using this peach colored pencil to just make that bow pop against the door a little bit more. So I think that worked out pretty well. I tried a colored pencil on the wreath. I'm like, yeah, you know what? The colored pencil really isn't doing much, but I did add a little bit to add a little highlight and shadow to it, but I don't really think it really helped all that much. Um, but, you know, the, the, the nice thing with the colored pencil towards the end is that you are just putting tiny little adjustments. Now, one thing to note with a colored pencil going over gouache and watercolor is that the colored pencil has a little bit of a sheen to it. Also, the texture of your paper, if you want a really crisp line, that watercolor paper texture is going to interfere with that and you end up getting a more grainy, grainy textured line. So if that's not what you're going for, you might want to use a pen or a fine brush with some gouache for those really, those really fine highlights. Um, 
on stone and stuff, it's perfect because it does give you that grainy, gritty feeling of stone. I decided not to do too much with a colored pencil because I didn't want to um, undo everything I'd done. And I wanted uh, to brighten up the glass in the window a bit. It looked a little too textured, so I decided to go with some watercolor and gouache together and glaze on. So now we're going to do a scary thing, and we are going to spatter this beautiful painting that we've spent two hours painting with some white gouache. Friends, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do it. I did remember to snap a picture of my painting, and you'll see me do that in a second. I did manage to snap a picture of my before painting just in case it was a total horrible mess. And if you're do doing this along with me in Critique Club, if you don't like the snow, just stop at this point and don't add any snow. That's up to you. Um, but, you know, I like to gild the lily. So what I'm doing here is I'm practicing on some black paper. I don't want my snow to be too fine because it's going to obscure too much and make it look misty. I don't want it to be too chunky because I don't want to have these big, huge wet snow snowflakes. And I haven't used the spattering tool in ages. So I'm just kind of getting used to it and um, figuring out how thick I need my gouache to be and uh, just practicing a bit before I do it on my actual painting. And I'm using my brush to load up the spatter tool. And I'm telling you, this is a little scary. Here's Here I'm bringing out my phone to take a quick picture. <laughs> of the painting before I potentially ruin it. And now I'm giving a little spatter of snow. Now, I think that looks cute, but honestly, I think a toothbrush might work a little bit better. Now I'm going over it with a toothbrush to give it some bigger flicks of um, spatter so the snowflakes can look closer to the viewer. You could do the whole thing with a toothbrush you, and you can blot it. If you make a mistake with it, when you're spattering with a toothbrush, you can blot it to remove those bigger splashes. I don't know if you caught that, but I had a couple like quarter size splashes of snow on there. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> we got to blot that girl. We got to get her out of there. Uh, and then I'm taking a fine brush to a small round brush. I guess it's not that fine. Uh, just to dab on some snow where I think it would naturally collect. Now, because the door is recessed, we're not going to see snow piling up on the wreath, but we will see snow on the um, stonework around the door and on the steps. And I'm thinking like the edges of the steps, like maybe the uh, somebody has come out and, um, and swept the steps a few times, but it's kind of collected at the edges. That's what I'm kind of thinking there. And I'm dabbing on some bigger snowflakes that would be closer to the viewer for a little bit of depth and perspective. Now, you know what? I have to say, looking back at this, um, and I think if I wax this painting, I'll bring back a little more of the luster and color back out again. But I think using the spatter tool gave me too fun a mist. I should have had my paint maybe a little bit wetter or maybe just done the just have used the toothbrush. I think that would have given me a much better effect. But then again, I also have the painting flat, so we're losing a lot of the um losing a lot, you know, a lot of it's getting, getting kind of like bleached out a bit. So when you see the photos at the end, you'll see how it really looks. Um, but uh, but overall, I'm pretty happy with this. I think I think if, if I did have to do one thing over, I would have just used a toothbrush and not messed with the spatter tool. But there you can see how it really looks. It's not bad. I think it's really pretty. And I think it would make a lovely Christmas decoration or Christmas card. If you enjoyed this and like to see it in real time, check out Critique Club. Link is in the video description. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye!